Tonight we have Dr. Steve Golden joining us. He is the CTO and founder, or co-founder of Catalytic Solutions Incorporated. Dr. Golden received his doctorate in material science at Imperial College in England. Um, he did extensive postdoctoral work here at UCSB in ceramic oxide materials. In 1996, after several years of industry experience, Dr. Golden founded CSI. CSI manufactures and delivers a breakthrough technology that significantly improves the performance and reduces the cost of catalytic converters. Um, Dr. Golden provides overall leadership and specific direction for CSI's product and process development and applications. So without further ado, Dr. Golden. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, very good to be here. Great that you all came in the bad weather to, to, to see and hear this. Hopefully it'll, it'll be worth it for you. Um, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just briefly kind of go through the, the kind of structure of, of basically what I'll do today. And once I've done this, you might want to leave if you're at the wrong, wrong lecture. That's okay. But, uh, but this is what we got on, on the slate today. And my main focus actually, which I'll come back to probably fairly frequently, is to look at the people aspect of what it is to do a startup and what really drives a startup. And obviously to do that, I'll, I'll go through um, some, uh, some of the basics of who we are, um, firstly. And then secondly, we look at, at the stages of growth of the company. We, we started in, in 1996, so, so um, eight years later, of what's happened basically and really stressing the point of, of, sort of how we've grown and what kind of stresses that really presents uh, to the people and, and the people aspect of, of the company. And then, and then thirdly and sort of finally really a look ahead for CSI in terms of what's going to happen in the future and the kind of growth that's in front of us and, uh, and really again trying to drive back to, to what's key in terms of how we can build our a team to meet those challenges. So it's going to be very much a people focus aspect of, of what makes a startup work. Um, and as so we, we've been very fortunate in the kinds of people we've been able to attract. Um, and so that'll be the basic story today. Who are we? What do we do? What does a startup do? And so, and so basically, what are we doing now? And to kind of paint that picture, to really sort of tell that story, I'm going to go through three elements pretty well over and over again. You'll be so bored of this by the end of the talk. But the three are basically, what do we have? What's the thing that we invented that's so, you know, so important, or that, or that we think is so important uh, to these various, various sort of companies? And, and really, secondly, how we connect that, that sort of platform uh, to the opportunities, which is kind of a, a key linkage. And then thirdly is looking at the market-driven opportunity. There's really three aspects to this. There's, there's the thing itself, there's the materials technology, but we have to try and connect it to a market. So there's really three things there. And if you don't see three things there, but only two, then I'll hopefully try and move you forward to see sort of three aspects to this. The founding business premise, it's almost so simple that it's almost kind of meaningless, actually. It says, we have this advanced materials technology, which I'll hopefully be able to uh, sort of go through with you today. And we're going to uh, try and apply this technology to solid, real, uh, big markets. No fuel cells, no, nothing that's not really established. And this was the founding premise. And I kind of came at this premise, which is really very simple. From, uh, from some years working for other startups before I started CSI. And, and I was trying to develop new technologies for a sort of new markets. And you have these two new things. And there's a third new thing, actually, which is the new company. And three new things in any kind of situation is probably too many new things. And it was very frustrating, actually, because you have this great technology, but there's no real market. There's no real marketplace for it. And you kind of, you kind of, I stick in with it for a while, but there's something wrong with this picture, right? So, so the CSI thing was to take away one of the variables and say, I'm going to take this materials technology and sort of really try and appoint it to very large customers with very real markets. And those markets exist now. It's just extremely simple. And so you take off, as so we take off one of the variables. And it's kind of 
has that sort of nice solid feel to it. It's not quite so exciting as trying to drive new markets. You're really just trying to fit into pre-existing markets and do that thing a lot better. Okay. And so one of the things that you do at the startup phase is this little connection that you forge between the thing you have in terms of the basic a technology platform and these markets. This 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 sort of link up seems so obvious. It's it's so obvious that surely it's been done before, right? Because everything's been done before. There's nothing new under the sun. There's all these big companies out there with vast teams of R&D people, and surely they've done this before because it's so obvious. It's so simple and obvious. And what you realize over the following years since, since what, 96, is it's not obvious at all to most people. And you become used to it and feel it's obvious, but it's completely new, and it's just a simple connection. Um, and actually, one of the things uh, one of the themes of this whole field actually is that it seeks to link up physics, chemistry, chemical engineering in this broad term called a material science and it really looks to apply it into the commercial world and that really for me defines materials technology. It's taking material science and then linking it up to something commercial. And it's that linkage that's really the start of the company, uh, start of any company really. And it's very important not to be from the industry, right? I started out this company not knowing anything about the major market we were trying to apply it to. That's very convenient and actually very important. And you can smirk and say, well, it's kind of, you know, you were just lucky. Yes, I'm sure I was very lucky. But if you knew too much about the industry that you were trying to penetrate with this new little widget or gadget or something, you would never try to do it. Because, you know, four years into the thing and we should be selling stuff to GM by now, but we're still three years away from that event. And, you know, you just have to keep, keep sort of plowing on and, and really, really holding on to that belief in, in that linkage you're forming um, because you're an outsider. So it's okay not to know too much about the thing you're doing. Just, just sort of knowing enough and having that simple link that is true is really enough to get you going and to really drive through all, all the frustrations of those next five to eight years. Um, my battery is fully charged, that's great. And, and a key theme about the people part of it, which is certainly true in my case, is that I had something to offer in terms of I um, wasn't just a linkage, but I actually knew something about the platform I was, I was trying to apply. And the theme here for this great place in terms of people studying, studying lots of different fields is, is your ability to really become a specialist in something. And until and unless you're that specialist in something, know something, your value in business to go into marketing and business and other things is really limited. And this is obvious to you guys because you're here to be specialists in something, to really get to the bottom of something, to know something. And until you really do that, you don't have anything to offer. CSI, GE, some other company. I mean, it, I mean it's so important to really specialize in, in something, to get to the bottom of something. You can branch out later, and, and so most of my um, talk after this is about it's important to make linkages with other fields and to, and, and, and to branch out. But that bedrock of knowing something, of, of being a specialist first, is really important. What that gives you, and what it gave me at the start of CSI, is a level of a belief in the basic thing that you're trying to sell, that you're trying to bring to the market. Because you know that, and it's a very solid foundation when you have that knowledge, it really is a very key platform to go forward. And it helps you predict and forecast. Probably as a, a PhD student, you really um, face a lot of time with sort of telling your boss when this result is going to happen. That's certainly my experience doing a PhD. You always, you always are forecasting something three to six months ahead. You had the facts and the data, but this guy was always wanting to know what's next and when are you going to you know, do this part. So you're always forecasting, actually, as a, a sort of technical person. It's not just about the facts, it's about forecasting forward to what's going to happen next. And that's making a connection, having a belief system for what will happen when you don't know it yet. We'll come back to that, that theme during, during the presentation. So it's important to have a big market. If you're going to do something new on the platform technology side, let's point the gun at something that's really real and big. And the, and the first thing that we started with here was, was this whole wave of, the whole, whole broad category of markets in terms of uh, a sort of three-way catalyst for cars, you know, diesel catalyst, the whole world of this, which is about eight, $8 billion a year. That's 
sounded pretty big to me anyway in, in sort of 96. It was a worthwhile, big, fat thing to point the gun at. And, and there was going to be converters on cars because the EPA is always tightening the emission standards and it was just going to get bigger and better. So it was nice and solid. The thing was, did this platform I thought was going to be relevant, is it really going to apply to this a big market? So it was a forecast. And I'll go into, into sort of some of the details. Basically, when you make a catalyst, um, as, sort of, as sort of some of you may know, by the way, you all have one on your car. So, you, so right under your feet, somewhere below the car, there's a catalyst. And it may have $100 of precious metal. It may have $300 of precious metal, but it's expensive. And, and the reason why for all the cost in, in these things that you have on your car right now, unless you have one of our converters on, on certain vehicles, which I can describe, um, is that the thing sinters at high temperature, these, these small particles grow and sinter to very large sizes. And that means the surface area is now very low, so you need lots of precious metal to really drive the reactions. So the platform that we brought to this, which, which I believe was relevant, was keeping things small. If you can keep, keep these small particles of oxides really small and drive large amounts of surface area, you can really greatly reduce the amount of these very expensive components in the converter. And that was a very simple kind of, kind of connection. Keeping things small at these very small sizes, even after high temperatures, you can really limit the amount of cost in these things and still have high performance. So linkage here basically in this slide is from the nanoscale, which is the thing in itself, the platform. And you put this coating on a thing, a thing called a honeycomb, which is uh, shown in the slide. And basically the gas goes down those channels and starts to react with a nanoscale catalyst and it converts from bad things to good things through the tailpipe. And that's what's happening when you turn the key on your car. And it's those little particles in the catalyst with that high surface area that's really driving that reaction. That seemed pretty simple. The question that we then had to work on was how to convince Honda, GM and Ford that we really had something and they could sign off on that. But that was the premise anyway. That was the core technology. It was a, a very basic, very, very basic platform. It was how to keep things small, um, which may seem very easy, but it's very hard to keep things small when they've seen high temperatures. And that was the thing I was offering the world, basically, or, or, or at least trying to in this case. Small is beautiful. And the result is that you can minimize the amount of a precious metal. On the, on the y-axis is a typical a sort of relative scale, but, but looking at, at a thing like a F-150, which has $500 of precious metal on it with a cone design, you can go from that to say you know, 50 or $60, and someone like Ford's gonna look at that difference of several hundred dollars and get fairly interested. If only it were true. And so you spend some years with, with Ford engineers trying to convince them that what they, what they can only dream about is actually true. But this is the basic um, kind of business model. It's saying to the car companies, in this case, we can offer you a catalyst for your vehicles that's going to offer you this huge sort of cost saving. And most, most big companies like Ford and sort of General Motors and Honda can really see that and sort of see the value. So the value was very simple once you boil it down to, uh, to the basics. Okay, so I'd like to go a bit more into this whole uh, connection thing, which is really the basis of this talk. It's, it's been very clear about the sort of technical argument, and I've, I've, I've sort of gone very, very quickly through that today in terms of the importance of keeping things small, um, even though they see a very, very high temperatures. And it's really helping people to understand that, because the first thing you do when you have a startup, at least what we did, we, we I tried to raise money. And when you're raising money, you're going to some local people in this case, and we're very blessed to be in this community where people have the vision to really help fund startups. Um, but you've got to try and describe what you're doing. You, ca you can't, just, you know, it's not just a black box. You've got to communicate three things. The platform, you've got to a really a, a be able to describe the a major markets that you're trying to address with the platform. And the third thing you're trying to communicate, there is a third thing, is how these two things are related that the platform actually is going to make a difference to these customers in these markets. And you've got to go to these people and explain what you're trying to do and, and so why you need their money. And for, uh, for someone from the UK, it's still a slightly odd experience to know that based on your forecast of telling someone something and a thing called a business plan, they're going to wire you lots of money into your bank account on the basis of some promise. I mean, this is a, still an amazing cultural fact of, of this state and of this country that people, people can, 
can really help to build the economy through the growth of these companies, really based on, on an act of faith. So you're trying to communicate something to people, you're trying to convince them of something, and there's these three things you're trying to uh, convince. And the best thing they can do, because they're not very technical normally, is to at least understand the market opportunity. Go and talk to GM, go and talk to Ford Motor Company about their needs. So they come back six months later and go, yeah, we've talked to some of them. Yeah, they, God, if you really had that, they would really buy lots of it, you know. And so you just move that process to really being able to analyze the market opportunity. And um, the other thing that starts to happen once you start getting funding, which we did, is you actually start talking to the customers themselves. And again, it's a bunch of people. You know, there's not such a thing as GM or Ford. Ford is a vast company of lots of business units and, and, and sort of people and managers. It's this engineer who has the global responsibility to source the catalyst on this vehicle, and it's a person. He sits in a very small office, and they give him a cell phone now so they can thrash him you know, 24 hours a day, basically, for, for being this, this key, sort of, key sort of champion, this key, key sort of a sourcing person. And it, it's very person to person, and so the people that you have in your team trying to convince this overworked, overstressed Ford engineer that you have the holy grail, you have the magic bullet, is that kind of process again. So it's a bit like the investors, only these are the customers, but they're just a bunch of people. And it's that people to people uh, sort of interface and those skills are really, is, are basically is really part of that kind of process. So that's the first market, and we're doing okay there because we're selling to Honda, Ford, and GM now, and you'll start to see our catalysts on, on some of the vehicles. And the fun thing is to see that startup experience in this particular market as the first of many opportunities. Now, of course, the tendency is in a, in a, like a big company like CSI, you know, we have 160 employees, is to, is to start to lose the edge of what you did at the beginning, which is to make a connection between a platform and a market, because there's plenty of other markets. But the tendency is to kind of, okay, well, let's slow down. That was really tough. We've got this big GM contract, and we've got to kind of, kind of, kind of draw back and really, but actually there's huge second, third, fourth market opportunities there which are very big as well. And you, you shouldn't wait for those because someone else is going to come in. So the key theme for us moving forward is to maintain that startup culture in a company that's starting to grow and become a bit more uh, big and clumsy, basically. So, so the goal, for, uh, my goal really for the company is to, is to try and look at these new opportunities and still drive that same sense of startup experience, even though we're not a startup company anymore but drive that connection uh, through to new markets. And, and to be that balancing act with the people focusing on the process and admin and sort of HR and all those good things is, is to really drive that fundamental connection towards new markets. And it takes a certain level of confidence and sort of belief in what you have to really do that again and again. And that's, that's part of the fun, actually. A kind of plug for the local community, people talk about California, and it's kind of a mythological place to some people's minds, but this local community is not a, a sort of mythological place, it's a real community. And we started life in Santa Barbara uh, in the first three or four years. And, we, and that early three or four years of getting funding, of meeting people who could share the vision for the company was really amazing to me, that in this place you could have in that group of individuals and to start to tap into those local people that could really see the vision for what we we're trying to do. That's sort of pretty amazing to have the vision but to try and convince someone else of that and, and for these people to really get on board and to be involved in the process. And not just to hand, as hand you the money and, and sort of leave but to be involved in sort of helping you to manage the process. So that's an amazing thing of being able to do this locally. Um, and of course this, this place, you know, this at this university is all part of that community because, because the excellence of the science community and the other fields here at UCSB are so kind of great now in terms of sort of standing in the world that, that we can tap into that expertise. We have a big sort of outsourced research department, it's called UCSB. And we can't afford to buy the equipment and, and to bring on people with the talent that is here, but we can a network and, and fund programs and sort of talk to people as, as part of the community. So I can't stress that enough. This couldn't have happened anywhere else. It's a very unique a kind of accident in time and place, and the place being here really. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Plug for the company. I can't do this apparently. I can't really plug CSI too much in, in this, but you know, we're a very successful kind of some mid-sized company now, and, and this is the kind of thing you present when you tell people how wonderful you are. But 
we have very good fortune in, in, in sort of some of the companies we've worked with, and I'll come back to that point, is one way to define CSI is in terms of who we work with. Um, these people call sort of customers, you know, the sort of dreaded customer. They really are what we are. You know, the good customers, the Honda, GM, Ford, and other people, really drives our business and really forming a partnership with these people. We've raised a lot of money to get to where we are today, which is a, a sort of facet of a startup. If you're going to make things and make things in large volume, um, you're going to have to raise some money to, to kind of fund that growth. The other key set of companies, are, we've brought in a lot of investment people over, over the, the, the time who have shared our vision of what we're trying to do. And they see us as a, as a great success story of having really good technology, fundamentally good technology, but also learning how to make things for very big markets. And so, so this is our, our group of friends, basically, that really supports us in, in, in this effort. A slight sort of digression. If you want to break from CSI and the startup thing, I'll just step to one side. This is kind of a slide for you to, to, to sort of, kind of relax a little bit. I, I went to a place called Sheffield in England, which is a, a great steel town, at least it used to be, uh, famous for making knives and forks. A Chaucer in 1340 referred to Sheffield in, a, in sort of part of one of his books. And the key thing there is kind of why, you know, Sheffield's kind of a, a place way over in England somewhere, you've probably never been there, but it's a key example of, of someone making a connection or, or a group of people, actually a bunch of individuals in this case, making a connection between things that were local, in this case, coal, which they could, they could form into coke um, for the blast furnaces, a lot of iron ore, and, and a lot of water to drive the mills, to sharpen the stones, to sharpen the cutlery. If you can sell a knife, it's going to have to be sharp. But the connection thing was very interesting. And, and, and back in the 1700s, this was new technology. You know, steel was pretty flash new technology. And I sat in a lecture in the late 70s, which kind of, kind of, kind of gives away my age a little bit listening to a, a professor of, of this center, which they set up there, called CGP, Ceramics, Glasses, Polymers. And they set up this, this unit in Sheffield so they didn't have to do metals. Everything was metal, steel, there were the world-famous people on, on, on these things. And they set up this little center not to work on metal stuff, but to do all the fun materials, you know, plastics, polymers, all these good things. And there was a lecture I went to in the late 70s there of this very kind of kind of world-famous glass scientist saying that fiber optics, this, this new thing, was never going to happen in his lifetime or, or his grandchildren's lifetime. It's like 150, you know, it's going to be so difficult to do this. And it's just an example of someone like a Corning, in this case, a very, a very well-respected American company, a big company actually here, having a vision to connect something and really hang, you know, they probably did you know, 10 or 15 years of research in this to really make it happen. And the fiber optics and that whole technology and how it's changing our society and, and really helping the whole, whole, sort of, whole, sort, whole, sort of, whole sort of telecom kind of boom, if you like, is, is a key example of someone seeing a connection. And there's this professor in England saying, you know, not, so not for 100 years, and yet, yet it's already happening. Someone's driving it, someone's making that connection. And, and it was so obvious that, that someone would maybe, but it had to be Corning or someone with a vision, even though they were a big company, to really drive that, that, that kind of thing. Okay, back to CSI. Um, part of the thing about doing a startup is that you've got this core platform, but you don't really know or you're not sure how it's going to move into the product space. Ford and GM and Honda, they can't buy a sort of concept. They can only buy a product. So you have to move from the platform to a thing called a product which is working out all kinds of difficult things about how to make it, how to process it. It has to fit in a certain shape and size. It can't explode. It, it can't be an odd color. They don't like catalysts being green, for example. You know, just, it has to be fairly you know, fitting within the package, basically. And so, so this slide is to show that you spend three or four years going from the platform to a product that even vaguely starts to work. It seems like a long time. If, if that platform was really so good and the connection was really so valid, would, wouldn't it be quicker than that? This is what I thought to myself. But actually, no, it's probably, it's probably the going rate, actually, to, to, to go all the way through to the product definition, which really starts the company. So 1999, we started talking to Honda. We thought we had a product, not just a platform, but gone from the platform, which I showed you, the little slide with the sort of nano crystals, And we had this converter. We had this actual product now. And that's really the start of... The company. You have to fund 
in, in five or six people for those three years just to get to the product level. Honda, um, I looked at the unit, they did some testing, it took about a year, we did a couple of iterations, and in 2000 they sent a team of 15 people over, we just, I just moved to Oxnard at this stage, and we had six employees, and they sent a team of 15 people from Japan because they wanted to buy this. Actually, wanted to buy us, but we, we didn't want them to buy us because we wanted to work with the other kind of bigger car companies. So the story goes that you know, we sat down, and the thrill of that moment, the absolute thrill of that moment of having a real customer coming in and, and, and sort of wanting to buy a product because they see the vision you had as being real. They've, they've, they've made a connection to, to see the value of, the, of this thing. Um, and the key next step for us is to drive this growth. You know, the growth curve I, I show here on the slide is, looks very mild and, and slow, but if, if, you, if you look at sort of 50 to 100% growth sort of year over year, that does present a certain challenge to a company. Um, there's certain things have to happen to allow that growth to occur. One thing is you have to be very flexible in how you bring on new customers, and you have to look at new markets, and you have to be very good at looking at new opportunities and not being frightened by them, but really um, sort of so if I try to map out a course through these opportunities, and that's how we're going to grow, you know, 50 to 100% a year over the next five to 10 years, is by looking at new markets, looking at new customers. And this little platform, this little thing, is going to go into all these markets because it's that good. It's that simple, I should say. So there's, there's five ways to define who we are in a typical startup, and, and there'll be a quiz at the end, by the way, on, on, on sort of which one you think we are. And, and don't spoil your balance, by the way. Okay, so I won't go. Um, so, so basically, the best definition I like in, in these things, you know, we could be a sort of nanotech company. That's that's pretty pretty nice sort of buzzword these days. You know, nano is a, a, a sort of big word. But we make things. We're a manufacturing company. So people go, well, your nano com your nanotech company. They don't really make things. They that's that's too smokestack. It's too too kind of boring. Um, but really, the best way to think about us with this platform is really a growth company looking at multiple markets. And it's interesting to try and present yourself as a growth company where what you do is make things, but also maybe license things as well. And, and really the final definition, at number five on this slide, is really the best one. It's really sort of defining who we are as the quality of the customers we have. It seems like an odd one. It's not about us, actually. It's about the customers. It's being out there with the customers, really understanding their problems and being responsive to their changing needs. And um, we'll spend quite a bit on change. This is what a real sort of nanotech company does. It makes things. It's the ugly side of nanotech, or it's the good side of nanotech. It's the money-making side of a sort of nanotech, basically. When you, you've learned how to take this, this sort of nanotechnology and you can make something from it. Okay, so I'll give you some background. Hopefully, you have a sense of who we are, and I'll, I'll try and drive a bit more a discussion in terms of the kind of people we need and the, the people that drive. Uh, so our success. Um, now, digression. A, little, a bit further south from this place called Sheffield, which I've already bored you with, I'm sure, is a, is a region about 40 miles south on the M1 in, in the UK. And there's a guy there called uh, Brian Clough. And he's my hero. I don't come from that part of England, so it's kind of a strange, strange bedfellow. But he, he um, ran a soccer club or sort of a football club, as I'm often... Um, I call these things. And they were a bunch of B players. They, they were big in the late 70s and early 80s. And they took on the giants of, of Spain and Italy, and they won all these cups. And it, it, it was a really a quite an amazing phenomenon, because it wasn't the big clubs in England. It was this guy called Brian Clough with his, with his team of happy guys. And when people started to look at the players in this team, they, they kind of, they're kind of B players. They kind of... They wouldn't be on the world eleven. They wouldn't even make it, you know, over here you know, in terms of the leagues here. They're kind of, they're kind of hardworking. They're tough guys. They're not great players, but the team was a great team. It, 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 it sort of won all these cups. And so one of the things about people, which you start to understand when you're trying to run a company, is that it's not necessarily people that look and feel like stars, but it's how the the team fits together and sort of how the people fit together. And. And so winning team, you know, the winning team consists of the best players. You know, Jack Welsh thought that was a, a good way to, to sort of um, kind of frame this. But Jack Welsh, I'm sure, was a very big fan of, of Notts Forest, this football team, because 
really what the best players are on the team is how they work together and, and, and having the right mix of people. But there are some things I'd like to push out here, so, you know, three, three main traits in terms of people that I've kind of noticed over the years that really drives value for CSI anyway. You know, be a specialist, I've already sort of done that, but, but sort of know something. In some field you're going to be a specialist, you're going to have, have some real understanding to give to people that's of value. You know, be, be sort of proud of being a specialist in, in sort of some areas. And of course, you need all the personality in, in the business world. You need a lot of personality. You know, need some some of toughness, some perseverance, energy. These are things you have right here at the school to survive this wonderful place in terms of getting your projects done. I'm sure. But these things multiply when you work for a company in terms of those those sort of personality parts. And so, be a hybrid. So I've said be a specialist. And now I'm going to sound very sort of confusing in terms of um, saying sort of be a hybrid. What, what do I mean by that? It means start off being a specialist and to understand that, but understand the linkages and the connections of that specialization to other parts of the business, marketing, manufacturing, you know, whatever it is, make, make those linkages. And your value escalates by a factor of two to three to five to ten in terms of the value to, uh, to the company. I have a lot of sort of technical specialists working for me and I have some fantastic hybrid people that really drive value because they're confident enough to go and visit the customer and, and sort of present what they're doing and get into a four-hour sort of Q&A session with the Honda engineers when you're feeling jet-lagged. You know, that person's going to go somewhere. But it comes from, from a core belief in terms of knowing what they know and being a specialist, but being able to, to go to the next level. So that's this hybrid idea which, which, which really drives our company and really drives a lot of the companies. I don't want a separate marketing person doing that. Uh, it may not be optimized in terms of you want the technical know-how, you want that that belief and that confidence in that person going into a customer, but then they can work with that marketing, in that marketing situation. So just, just a little bit more on the people side, you know, the employees of a company. Uh, of course, you can look at the people, you can look at the partners, you, you can look at the people at the customers, um, but really the people that drive CSI in terms of my group, where it will become a billion dollar company through this growth year over year at some point, it's really people that can make predictions. And, and so when you're doing research, you're actually always making predictions as to what you're going to be sort of doing in the next three to six months. And that's, that's part of your life, really. It's sort of forecasting. And so most of research in the corporate setting is like kind of forecasting what's going to happen in the next three months or the next year's budget and that kind of thing. So you're always going outside the facts, uh, basically. Having a lot of confidence so that when you fail, you can kind of keep keep sort of believing in, in, in the basic premise of what you're doing to really drive through those failures. And you're selling to people, and when I say selling, I don't mean that in a negative sense, but you're trying to uh, convince a customer, which is a set of individuals, basically about your product and, and what you're doing and, and your project. So that's a, that's a key skill set. This growth thing, so we've got the four markets that we're looking at on this slide now, which really kind of paints a picture of a lot of complexity. And if you take any one of these kind of segments, as auto, catalyst, diesel, energy, these are very big companies with a lot of changing demands. And so this is kind of going to look like a, a very sort of chaotic a, a company in, in a kind of good sense of really looking at a lot of growth. And, and so how to manage that in a, in a team and to lead that company is obviously very, very difficult. Um, but the thing to do is to drive that connection in the startup mode in each new business unit. It's a whole other startup. It's in the same company. It's still CSI, but now you want to really build up that startup feeling and that experience in each new business opportunity. So this is where we are. If, if, if you're driving down Highway 1 towards Malibu and, and down the coastal route, you can stop by and say hello. We're just off Highway 1. I'm about 45 miles from here. And this is our, our big sort of outsourced research, sort of research center. It's uh, such an important facility for us. We've got some offices in other parts of the world, but this is our home factory where, where we spend most of our time. I can go through the markets in diesels, they're big for us. Putting, putting catalysts on a gas turbines is a very big growth market that we're moving into. In this case, these are a small number of very large catalysts, but they're very important in terms of controlling the NOx on, on, these, on these important things. And we're also looking at sort of chemical type applications. So just a kind of kind of complete the talk by going back to, to where I started. 
I'll talk about change in probably three different ways um, that we, we see now. So we've kind of grown up, we're eight years old, we might actually make a profit next year finally. And we've got this massive growth in front of us, and we've got a really good platform to do that. And there's at least three types of change that we see that really present a challenge to us and, and, and sort of to the people at CSI. Firstly, there's this notion that you know, CSI, we're in Oxnard, you know, this is where we are. There's these things called customers out there we have to deal with occasionally, and they're useful because they kind of you know, pay our bills and so forth. Oh, well, okay, that's not so good, so we need to face outwards, we need to face the customer. But that's not really enough, that's not really what we need to be. We need to be out at the customer, we need to be out there literally at the customer, pointing in. So on the right-hand side, I've, I've shown a more true picture of what it takes because you're looking at customers in a very changing world. And it's not just pointing out to the customer, it's being in there, it's being at the customer, face to face, it's like really understanding their problems. Not just sort of heading back to Oxnard because that was, you know, real life's a bit complex out there, but really getting into their problems really, really side by side. So the, that's one part of change that you start to realize is that people want, want sort of a nice stable life, they want a nice, long project, it starts, there's the peak and then it ends and then you, you finish something. Working with customers in this environment uh, at least, one's aware of that's a luxury that very rarely happens. You start a project, you're three months into it, the customer decides to change the program or that vehicle they were going to sell with your product on is, is completely cancelled because their competitor had bought out something else. And it just starts to speed up actually, there's a speeding up of this um, kind of kind of market environment right now. So you've got to be out there because you've got to understand these changes and get to like them. And it's, it's quite interesting to manage these changes in terms of having a group of people working on the project to tell them that all that work you've been doing for the last three months, it's all changed. We're going to do this other project now. And so being close to the customer, really understanding kind of their changes, what the, what the consumer wants to buy in terms of vehicles, for example, is, is very key. The second change I've already touched on is a new markets. Um, to really build growth in the speed we're trying to do, we need to look at new markets in diesel trucks, gas turbines, and, and the whole thing. And so that's a change, because you just got used to working with the car companies, and you think you understand how they think. You think you understand how that market is driven. And now you're talking to a whole, whole new market segment. And they've got completely different rules, completely different boundary conditions. And you can say, well, that's just, God, we just got used to the car companies, now we're doing some whole new thing to drive value. But it's, it's the world. I mean, it's, it's being responsive to that and really kind of looking forward to that change, actually. That's the second one. And then third, your third is the business model, right? So we've got a business model that's pretty straightforward. We make catalysts and we sell them to car companies, to sort of diesel companies and, and, and sort of so forth. And the thing that we make, we actually... Um, I bring through all the way from the platform to the product stage as well. So it's all nice, it's all tidy, we've got our hands on everything, right? And we kind of ship the product to a canning company that puts it in a, in a metal a, a can that goes on the exhaust, and it's all pretty sealed up. And it's a nice, simple business model. This is CSI. Well, what about this model? This is also CSI. So if we're going to drive value in certain other industries, we're going to license our technology platforms to other people to make the catalyst. And so we're going to get royalty fees from a licensing mechanism. Well, that's a whole different business model. But it's a growth point, it's a change for the company. You've just got used to the manufacturing thing, and we've got all the teams, we've got that structure. Now we're going to license things. And that calls for a different skill set of people, a different group of people to really drive that value. So that's kind of three, in a very short nutshell, in a very small, a small nutshell, it's kind of three types of change that we're really seeing that, that does stress stress leadership, it really stresses people that are trying to drive this at, at CSI. So the top part, you know, this notion that, that things are evolving nice and slowly out there. You know, history is pretty well sort of, sort, of, sort of continuous and you can see it coming and you can manage it. Probably not the case. At least the world we're in, it's just not, doesn't feel like that anymore. If, if it did in 98, 99, certainly doesn't now. I mean, things are really, really kind, of, we're kind of speeding up. The actual reality is this fairly sort of sudden change that you notice, you know, disruption you could call it, and you have to be able to adapt and have people that can run that and people that can do that. And it's a certain mentality, a certain mindset. It's actually fun actually. There's never a dull moment. 
and you've got to come into the chaos and make some order out of it, but not too much order, because there's going to be some other changes around the corner. So the notion that there's some nice evolutionary thing to kind of hang your hat on is kind of stable is probably not where we're at anyway. There's probably plenty of big companies that are much more stable, but, but I would argue that the good big companies like the GEs and so forth are looking at change very aggressively uh, to, to manage growth. And so, so just on the bottom there, you need to think ahead before the change happens. You need to be right there, probably ahead of the curve, to use the cliche. And that takes a certain amount of guts and a certain amount of vision to do that. Um, by the time you respond to something, it's probably too late. And that's kind of a, a good slide to end on, really, just to wrap up the whole thing. But just to go all the way back to the beginning, the three things that, that one really sees as being important is is having that sort of technical know-how, the real sort of technical uh, sort of background that you need to bring to a company, to a university, um, and to be able to connect it to a business opportunity to kind of drive your value by being a very key member of the team to look at other opportunities, whether it's marketing and, and these other skill sets. Because, because we're making connections with the platform and these great opportunities, and, and the people in a company like ours have to be able to uh, sort of drive those those links themselves. So, hopefully, I've given you a bit of an insight into who we are and to what it's like to be in a startup and to kind of grow out of the startup. And, and I'd be very happy to entertain any 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 thoughts and questions. Thanks a lot. Steve, I was just kind of curious. From the time that uh, now you've got a stable product, you're manufacturing uh, hardware and getting out the door. How much? Uh, how much do you spend in R&D on the next wave of products, right. the next innovation, or what's coming up around the corner? So, um, kind of in terms of headcount, if you think, think of it that way, we have, we have, we have about 160 employees, about 35 in R&D, um, because you have a lot of sections of the company looking, looking at manufacturing's operational side. So, and, the, and to sort of, so you look at the dollar value of that, you think, well, that's tiny compared to the big companies, because the big companies, it's spread extremely thin. The big thing they have, it's spread extremely thin. So actually, we have a lot more intensity, actually, for us, even though it sounds like a small number of people to compete with the big guys than the big guys have. And we're always looking at ways that we don't need to emulate our competition. They've got 150 people on this project, we've got six. It doesn't sound right, it doesn't sound fair. We actually don't need and we don't need 30, actually. It's about what you do and how you structure it. And so the thing we're wrestling with at the moment is how we escalate the research budget to meet these new challenges of these huge growth opportunities, but to keep a very tight lid on, on sort of cost expansion in this, in this critical phase. So it's, it's a balancing act, but it's all about being efficient and having these teams really working efficiently together. Any other questions? Uh, when you talk about staying ahead of the curve, what is your criteria for taking like a calculated risk that allows you to lead into the the unknown? Well, there's two there's two kind of things going on in that in that calculated risk. There's what you can do on the process side. You, you can you can there's great tools and ways to analyze potential opportunities. Um, the, and that's a very solid thing you have to do. You have to try and use the tools you, that are there to, to kind of do that. The flaw with that, or, or the shortcoming of that, which means you need to do other things, is that, by definition, this is something that's a small cloud on, in, in, in the sky, not a storm yet. And you, you can tend to analyze big things, but the tools themselves have to try and forecast something that's not here yet. And so you start getting into other qualities in terms of gut feeling, it's probably a cliche on that one, but in terms of those linkages and certain amounts of intelligent kind of guesswork, actually. And it's almost a feeling as well. It's kind of, it feels like something we should do. And that's not enough in itself. You still have these other tools and ways to analyze situations, but you can't do it by the numbers. It's not a numbers game. Someone's gonna to have to have a vision and, and have, have some level of, of sort of leadership to step in and, and make that connection and, and, and bet on something. So it's kind of a combination of those two. Uh, yeah. Um, you talked about uh, when you had GM 
uh, and then your inclination was to lay back and not move forward. How did you prepare your company to handle the, uh, I mean, how did you stay from being overwhelmed with all the new business? Well, I think the key, the key thing is to look at the company as having different departments. And, and, and the tendency in a startup, it's very common to start up, but everyone's doing everything. You have 15 people in the company. Everyone's turning their hands at every single thing. But when you start to get structured, even, even at our vast scale of 160 people, you do have people with different levels of expertise to do different things. And the guys making product and sort of shipping stuff to Honda, Ford, and GM, that's a complete group from my group who are focusing on the new stuff, which is 2008, 2010 timeframe. And there's a disciplined approach to managing focus and sort of resource where you have a group of people whose job it is to look forward to the long-term growth. And there's always a tendency, though, to, to try and you know, compress things and to, and to lose structure. But you've got to keep the shape of the team there, the, the shape, where there is a group really focusing on, on a long-term growth, and that's their job. And that's not to be confused with the people that are, are making the product in, in, in the short-term horizon. So that's, that's a key fact. Steve, it seems like you've migrated from a more traditional uh, design, build, sell business model into a sell, design, build model. Can you speak to how that transformation took place? And sell, design, build. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I, think, I think what you could be getting at is, is that we tended to get the customer early in the process. So if I can just kind of cite an example. We went to Honda with a prototype that based on some very basic testing I knew was from the platform in, into a certain level of product, a definition. But we never tested our a product on the Honda Accord or their vehicles. We didn't show up with the thing all wrapped up. You know, okay, it's, and then you go in. It was, it was a bit of a, um, a bit early, a bit sort of too early, one might say. But you went in with, with enough data and a lot of belief system and a lot of ability to convince someone that there was something tantalizingly new there with the right customer with that mindset that they're going to look at something new because they're, these guys are crazy looking new things. You know, they're, they're a real kind of great company to work with. Uh, going into GM with that would, forget that. In GM, you know, where's the numbers? Show me the data. That'd be completely wrapped up. Honda had a way of looking at it which, which made them a great first adopter of kind of looking at the glint in my eye or, or looking at the promise there and really, really going out on a limb and getting resources to test our product. And we had basically no data, you know, very, very little data to show them. So I think it gets to the different types of customers you're dealing with. Um, and it gets to their level of need. And, and, and the more needy they are, the more they're able to short circuit the normal cycles and, and get pretty far ahead of themselves. More questions? As sort of a follow-up to that question, what would you say were the biggest challenges to uh, sell to your customers? to get them to buy? Uh, I mean, in the case of Honda, it was so much of a simplistic thing, so much of a simple thing. It was just a technical, it was just, did this thing work on their vehicle? Did they come up with the numbers that we predicted? If they would, then it was success. If not, it was failure, go back to Oxnard, never see us again, you, you know, it doesn't work. So it's this very simple thing. It's almost a perfect opportunity because it was just down to one type of thing. It was a technology. Looking at GM and Ford, a much more complex set of things had to be met. You have to have a quality system. I have a thing called, you know, called a quality system because you're going to make something for Ford and have this quality system. Honda didn't let that kind of worry them too much too early. You know, GM had other things, other things you had to meet in terms of basic systems. And so we have a range of customers with, with different levels of demands. And for, for some of the other guys, like, like the Ford and GMs, that were the second wave you had to be a lot more grown up and sort of resourced to meet these other criteria, which you could argue were really secondary to the main product, but had to be delivered to them. And I'm sure we'll find with some of the other uh, key customers in these growth areas that they're going to place very high demands on, on CSI systems, not just a product. Steve, to this point, your focus has been significantly uh, with Japanese clients and uh, North American clients. Could you talk a little about the challenge and opportunity that Europe might represent? Yes, the challenge actually is, is an interesting one. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of from over there. Well, I'm from the UK, but I'm not sure whether we're part of Europe or not some of the time. But I feel like I'm more European than some of my colleagues. And, 
And it's a great market out there. They make loads of diesel vehicles, and they all need good catalysts. They need our technology so badly. And yet they're very entrenched relationships with their current suppliers. You go to VW, and they've got three or four suppliers on these products. And they've built up these relationships over 30 years. You know, and it's going to be interesting to try and analyze the different customers as we build that strategy to really work with the right are the right customers. And it may not be the biggest customers. It might be a Honda-type customer first over there. The other thing that we, we've learned, which is kind of interesting, a shipping product to a Japan from Oxnard works. It goes to Long Beach. It gets on the boat. It takes four weeks somehow to get over the other side of the, that big pond. And that's a flow that's kind of good for the whole sort of Japanese trade stuff. Europe, it has to be made over there. So we have, to, we have this extra complexity of just, just as we're going to make money next year to think about, about the growth of the operations of CSI to kind of meet the demand. Because what if they love our product, and they probably will? The next step is to, is to unveil or plan to build a factory, probably somewhere in, in sort of Poland these days is the flavor of the month, to address their needs. And you look at the complexity of trying to map out a whole new facility 6,000 miles away, and you start to you start to try and get really clever with how you can do that. And, and so we're analyzing different ways in which we can partner with people there to really drive that, that, that sort of operational complexity to make it you know, slightly more, more, sort of, um, more sort of manageable, basically. A couple final questions. Uh, Steve, what strategies are you using to protect your technological edge? Do you have patenting? Uh, how, are you, how are you trying to keep your competitors from, from stealing what they already know about what you're doing and uh, running off and doing it in a different way that's equally uh, valuable to your customers? That's a good question. Um, we first sold the product to Honda, the first platform, which is in uh, 2000, which is basically the start of our competition, being able to buy that catalyst and starting to analyze it. So, so game was on, you know, 2000, okay, the clock's ticking. They're all buying our catalyst and sort of analyzing it. And they're writing reports to Honda saying they don't really see what's in there. And you wait about nine months to a year, and you kind of expect them to be clever enough to back into what's in the technology, because it's just a bunch of you know, crystals and phases and stuff. And you can analyze these things, and you can probably back into the process even. And what's interesting was, after about a year of not sleeping very well and being pretty nervous, we didn't really get any feeling that they could be bothered. Maybe they were looking at it very hard, but didn't really kind of unlock the secrets through that route. And so part of that has, ha has had an effect on our, our IP strategy. I'm not going to disclose what they can't discover themselves. And, and the patent is only the start of, of how you protect the technology. It's not the end of that. So, so we kind of have a fairly good balanced approach in terms of different segments to look at how we balance our, our trade secrets in this, in this core market, basically, uh, versus other types of approaches, which are more normal in other growth markets. But basically, uh, a sort, of, sort of having a patent issuing is, is a form of disclosure. And you normally patent your best stuff. And so now you've given the blueprint to people to, to, to try and work around. And so that's led us to be fairly pragmatic, I'd say, in terms of that balance. The uh, automotive industry is well known for you know pressure on your price margin. Like, how do you expect <laughs> to deal with that in the future? So, it's probably the most extreme case is, is sort of something like a a General Motors is probably the the paradigm of of the cost squeeze. You know, they're going to save another half half a billion dollars next year, and it's going to be through the supply chain. And so, you know, they're the prime example of the, of the squeeze being really on now, and it's 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 tough for people with. Sm with sort of very low profit margins, for example, sort of, sort of people in the sort of, sort of tier one space, and, and so sort of GM come knocking for the cost save, and hey, you know, we don't want to give the product away. And, and that, that, that pressure is pretty intense. The only way out of the pressure, the only way out is to continue to move the product forward in leaps and bounds, to continue this notion that you have good technology. Now, good technology in this context means really something pretty unique in terms of cost performance combination. So the precious metals in these things, which is a big cost driver for GM, you're showing a major, major improvements over every one to two years. And they can see you as a key partner in this effort for them to lower their cost, but it's really driven through your technology and not through 
as well margins being being slashed, which is the normal mode. You know, so so we're very lucky to be in this space because we have a vehicle to drive value for GM to help them save money, but to still keep fairly you know, fairly okay margins. And that's all about technology. And without that, it'd be it'd be horrible. It would be it wouldn't be wouldn't be too good. So it's all about those those nano crystals and and so what they do basically. Um, what criteria do you use in a decision whether to sell or to license? Um, the the main thing is, and the thing that we learned when we started talking to the car companies was that they didn't see any paradigm that they knew of where we would license to one of their current suppliers. And it's very sort of very sort of competitive. They didn't see a way to really get the value through a kind of a cross-licensing deal. They wanted us to step up to be a manufacturing company, to bring the value, to bring, to bring as much technology into the to manufactured product actually as the core technology. And that was the, the, the key message. And we knew we had to scale up and do all that stuff. For the markets that we're looking at in terms of the growth side, there are people that already make the catalyst. And it's a different type of catalyst. It's not coating a honeycomb. It may be making some other form. And it may be a a segment where the cross-licensing thing happens a lot already, and I'm thinking about the chemical market, the chemical a segment. And obviously that's going to be something we're going to be looking at seriously as a way to license things and then not, not to do all that infrastructure build up to make this new form of catalyst. So there seems to be, there seems to be a natural way you can, can look at these things that seems to point in, in sort of these different, different places. As you were dealing with the pressure as your companies evolved over the last few years, and were there times when you looked at the business model and, and maybe had a, a chat with yourself about third-party licensing being an easier oh, yeah. life for you? Yeah, having said all that fine speech, yeah, I'm now going to sort of cave and go, yeah, there are times when you really think about the big infrastructure build-up because because you look at the cost structure of having to invest all the people involved in that, and it puts pressure on, on a certain amount of success having to come through to really make it work. And when you're starting out, you don't have a lot of customers. And if one customer gets wobbly or they're not selling as many vehicles as they think they should, you know, the whole thing kind of, you need to take a hard look at this. And that's actually one of the reasons for needing to spread into other markets in a sensible way, is to really sort of be a much more stable company. And just in that early years, they you're looking at a couple of customers and they're just starting out and if something went wrong or there was some pullback and that particular vehicle wasn't so, it could have such a huge effect. And yeah, you do go through that hard, hard sort of Q&A, like, like, you know, is this really the model here? It's, it's, it's too risky, it's too much of a But I think we're through that now, but there's some period probably in those early years that, that some of the leadership at CSI um, are with me, who, who are much more experienced on the business side, really stepped up and had that leadership to, to really sort of, sort of, sort of stay the course on the business model. But there were some rough moments, and and there'll probably be more so. But I think as we grow up as a company with more, more customers and more spread through different segments, it'll it'll become less, less of a sort of, sort of tough one. Do we have one final question? Okay, then that concludes our question and answer. Um, thank you once again, Stephen. Thanks.